Let's now continue our discussion and proceed with the different types of motion. The following figure shows the three types of motion, which is no different from the solving problems that you might have encountered already during your physics class. So we have translation, rotation, and general plane motion or plane motion, which is just a combination of translation and rotation. First, let's focus about translational motion. Take note that under it, we have rectilinear motion and curvilinear motion, which we will also tackle shortly afterwards. So what is translational motion? It is simply a motion of a particle or rigid body from one point in space to another. In this motion, the body simply shifts its location. However, for a body to be considered purely translational, the position of particles must be kept parallel to its starting position as it travels along its particular path. We will see shortly how this look like as we go through with its subtypes. So translational motion has two subtypes. First one is rectilinear translation or rectilinear motion in which a particle or a body as group of particles moves along a straight path. The other type is curvilinear translation in which a particle or a body moves along a curved path. Now kindly observe from both of the figures shown that their motions are both considered as purely translation since the position of particles are kept parallel to its starting position as it travels along their path. So for example, here in rectilinear motion, the initial uh, position of the particles AGB should be parallel with the particles of this body as it travels along the path. Let's say that when this body reaches the middle of its path, then particles AGB of that body must be parallel also with the orientation at its initial position. So every time that the particles travel along this path, it, the particles AGB must remain parallel to its, position, to its initial position. So it does not only apply at the middle portion, but also to other portions of the travel path. The same goes with curvilinear translation in where the, as the body travels along this curved path, the particles AGV must remain parallel with its, in, with its initial position. So for example, this body reaches the middle of its path. Then these particles AGV must remain parallel to its initial orientation. And that also applies with the other portions of its travel path. So with this in mind, we can say that the body undergoes a purely translation since particles AGB, as shown here, is clearly not experiencing a rotation, but just traveling by purely translation. So that's the meaning of purely translational motion. To relate those subtypes in real life, let's look at some examples. The straight movement of the print head, print head of a printer as shown, and also the travel of a car in a straight road are examples of rectilinear translation. For, for curvilinear translation, we have projectile motion as an example along vertical plane. 
and we have the curves of roadway as an example along horizontal plane. Now that we have an understanding about translation, let's go back a few slides and look at other types of motion. The next type of motion that we will tackle is rotational motion. Please take note that under this type, there is centroidal rotation and non-centroidal rotation. So what is rotational motion? It is simply a motion in where all particles of a rigid body move in, move in concentric circles. Or a group of circles with various diameter yet with same center point. In this type of motion, we are dealing only with group, group of particles or rigid body. So if the problem can be idealized as particle, then you don't have to investigate the rotational motion. Rotational motion is only for rigid bodies. Like translation, rotational mo motion has also its own, own two subtypes. The first one is centroidal rotation in which, as its term implies, a body rotates about its centroidal axis. Example of that is the spinning of gears and the rotating turbine of a wind energy system. The other subtype is non-centroidal rotation in which also, as, it, as the term implies, a body rotates about non-centroidal axis. Examples of that is the rotation of the boom of lifting crane in where the axis of rotation does not pass through the centroid of the boom but rather on the joints as shown in the figure. Another classic example is the pendulum in where the axis of rotation pass through the point on the upper end of the string rather than on the centroid of the hanging object. So again, going back a few slides, we can see that the last type of motion to be discussed is plane motion or also called general plane motion. However, there is not much detail to dive for this one since it is simply a combination of translation and rotation. So obtaining the necessary skills to solve problems about translation and rotation are the fundamentals to solve problems about plane motion. Anyway, you might have observed that several branches and sub-branches of dynamics and motion were discussed so far. Since later in this sem, you will soon be challenged with a lot of problem solving. It is very essential that we start with the basics or some guidelines in the form of preliminary assessment. So these are in the form of questions that will help you avoid the confusion of looking at so many branches and sub-branches and guide you to determine which idealization area of dynamics and type of motion does the problem belongs. When solving dynamic problems, you may ask the following. First, do geometrical dimensions matter? This question will lead you to what idealization to use. It can be either particle or rigid body. If the answer is yes, the object is a rigid body. If the answer is no, the object is considered as a particle. Next question that you may ask, are force or applied force and mass considered? This question will lead you to what area of dynamics you should set your mind. So it can be either kinematics or kinetics. If the answer is yes, it is a kinetic problem. If the answer is no, it is a kinematic problem. Lastly, what type of motion is involved in the problem? 
this question has only three possible answers. By just imagining the motion as described by the problem, you will surely identify the type of motion that is involved. It can be translation or rotation or a combination of translation and rotation. Please always take note the following. Particle or bodies that, is, that are idealized as particle can perform only translational motion, while bodies that are idealized as rigid body, they may perform translation, rotation, or the combination of translation and rotation. So, these three questions are the guidelines. Now, the same with your physics and statics in the past, we will also be dealing with SI units and U.S. customary units. The following table shows the comparison between SI and U.S. customary units of the basic units to be used for mechanics. Just take note that for SI, our the unit that we will use is Newton. And take note of this equivalent of Newton. And also, most students forget this um, unit of mass for U.S. customary units, and that is slug. And the equivalent of slug is this one. Just take note. To aid us in solving problems that necessitates shifting of system of units, you can also refer to this table, conversion factors. And lastly, you might encounter problems with prefixes, such as, for example, kilonewton or millimeters, you may refer to this table, as well as take note of the symbol. I recommend that before you proceed with the next topic, please review these three tables so that it will help lessen the burden of handling the units in our future problem solving. The final thing that we will review before we end the discussion is vector and scalar quantities. To differentiate them, let's consider the following figure. As you can see in the right, speed is a scalar quantity. See, the scalar quantity is described only by magnitude, while the weight of the apple is a vector quantity since it has both magnitude which is indicated by the scale and direction which is downward for all gravitational forces on earth to further see the difference between vector and scalar quantities we can refer to the following table in this table the first two rows are pretty much self-explanatory However, in the third row, we can see that scalar quantities can only change in magnitude, while for vector quantities, they can change either in direction, magnitude, or both. Also, scalar quantities has no components, which means they cannot be resolved, while vector quantities, they can be resolved using trigonometry. So, example of scalar quantities are length, mass, energy, and density, which are all described only by magnitude while common examples of vector quantities are displacement velocity acceleration and force with all the concepts that we have reviewed and discussed i hope you will go back to the objectives of this lecture just to see if you can recall the concepts from your physics and statics and that you can be familiar with the different branches under dynamics and also take note of the preliminary assessment to help you in the future in solving problems and also take note of the difference between scalar and vector quantities so that's it for today I hope you learned something new or have more clarity from, from our discussion. Please stay safe and healthy always. Let's see you again in our next topic. 
God bless future engineers.